Okay, so uh, welcome to everyone and thanks for, uh, I mean we have stiff competition, the Dalai Lama is here and you all have shown up here, so you know, as uh, my colleague was saying, it means you must be really interested, so that's great. <laughs> so um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dinesh Singh. Uh, he is the Vice Chancellor of uh, Delhi University and he is also uh, a mathematician uh, in the mathematics department. Uh, he does functional analysis, he does uh, operator theory, and these are of course, uh, you know, things that we are going to actually quiz you on afterwards. So, so you know, you have to really pay attention and take notes. Um, but actually our session today is on Ramanujan, uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Singh is going to, we, we're going to have a conversation about him, and then maybe just branch out uh, just to general uh, other other issues about mathematics, um, and you know, just just before I start, I should also perhaps both of us can thank uh, the literature festival uh, in terms of being broad enough to include uh, such diversity into their schedule. So welcome, Dr. Singh. Or thank Dinesh. you, thank you, Mal. I, I'm delighted to be here, and I appreciate the invitation from the festival for this conversation. It's important to talk about Srinivas Ramanujan from many uh, points of view, including literature. He's inspired a great deal of literature and uh, also this is his 125th birth year. And it's important that we remember him and pay our tribute to him. So, glad to be here. Sure. So, I thought that um, what, what we would do is maybe first just um, uh, talk about his life because as you were saying, it's such a dramatic life that, he's, he, that he led. So maybe you can just start us off, uh, just tell us a little bit about what his background was, where he came from. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So Ramanujan was born 125 years ago. You can try and imagine India of that time. It was a small village, well it's just a little more than a village, near Chennai, Madras, as it was known in those days. And he was born in an extremely modest family. So they really weren't people of much means. And there wasn't much in terms of access to high-end literature or science. So Ramanujan was really almost by himself in that environment. And it's interesting to know that till the age of five, he wouldn't speak or write. And I have wondered about this, you know, Einstein couldn't do that till right. almost that age. I was age. just going to say the yeah. same thing, yeah. And uh, I have marveled about this, Manil, because up until some time ago, schools in Delhi would admit uh, children at the kindergarten stage by interviewing them. I don't know if they still do that. But I've always wondered, they're probably eliminating all potential Ramanujans and Einsteins, right. you know, by doing that. Because they couldn't speak or read or write. So Ramanuja's mother was worried about this. Like all good mothers, and then like all good Indian mothers, the only solution comes from the mother's family. So she decided to take Ramanujan to her father. And it worked, because Ramanujan's father used the barest and crudest of technology. They were poor people, remember this. So he used to spread grains of rice on the floor and he taught Ramanujan the letters of the Tamil alphabet using a stick, tracing the letters on the rice. And something clicked in Ramanujan's mind. And he began to learn the alphabet and he began to speak as well. And so at some stage, the father then returned his grandson back to his daughter and Ramanujan was then admitted to a school in the village, Kumbakonam. And that's where he was exposed to mathematics. And I have always believed that within each one of us, there's a drum beat, some, some rhythm that resonates inside. And the challenge in our lives is to somehow recognize that drum beat and then march in consonance with that drum beat in the world. Some of us are fortunate, we recognize that drumbeat early, some, some of us don't. Ramanujan was one of those who recognized that rhythm within, and that was mathematics, it resonated. 
and he marched in the real world with that and in school very soon he had caught up with all that was being taught and had produced much more than what was being taught in school by himself. So he had begun to discover original mathematics of a very high order. And, and was this recognized by his teachers or were there any accounts of you know, people uh, he, that people actually know, knew what he was doing? And so you know, so long as the maths was understandable to his school teachers, they understood that he is mm -hmm. doing good stuff. Okay. But you know, once you transcend that, then they were lost mm -hmm. and they couldn't tell. They recognized because of his schoolwork that there was certainly extraordinary ability. But you know, it can easily get derailed. He was extremely enthusiastic, very committed. And his father used to frown upon this excessive attention to mathematics. And so Ramanujan was a little worried about that. He would conceal his attachment to mathematics from his father. But his teachers recognized that there was something great happening here. They couldn't tell what it was. And then he had finished school, done exceedingly well in mathematics, entered the bachelor's program at the Madras University. But then he fell into some trouble there. So he was excessively devoted to mathematics to the exclusion of everything else. You know, there is this couplet by Kabir, mm -hmm. Sahib mera ek hai dujha kaha na jai. Dujha sahib jo kahu, sahib khada rasa hai. I have but one master, one God, and I must devote myself to the exclusion of everything else to the service of that God. And then that God will come to me. And that's what Ramanujan did. So, to the exclusion of everything else, Mirabai did that. You know. Mira ke Prabhu Giridhar Nagar Dujha na koi. Nothing else but Giridhar Nagar. And then your God is bound and that's what happened with him. But you see, the real world is not necessarily God's world. And so he failed the English examination at Madras University. Ah. And you know, till then he was receiving a scholarship as well. Coming from a poor family, the money was handy. He could then use that to support himself and his father wouldn't find him a burden. But because he failed, the scholarship stopped. Now, I have thought about this, you know, what was he really failing at in English? Because I've seen his letters. He wrote innumerable letters to mathematicians all over India and then in Great Britain, asking them to pay attention to his work and give opinions. And the English is very, very good. You can tell that this person understands, has a good command over English. What he was failing at was Shakespeare. Huh. Now he didn't like that. He wasn't interested in that. But then he had to opt out. That system didn't recognize him. And now things were not good for him. But again, his mother intervened. You know, she decided the best solution is to get him a wife. So Ramanujan was married off. And what age was this? This was very early in life. So he was in his first year bachelor's. So okay. I presume he must have been 16 years of age or right. so. And uh, he, he was married off. Now here is where some, sometimes unwittingly, inadvertently good things can happen. So now he had a wife. He said, I need to support myself and I need a job. So where could he find a job? By then, some people in Madras who knew reasonable mathematics had taken note of Ramanujan. Mm. And so they began to pay attention to what Ramanujan was trying to do. They couldn't fathom his maths. And I'll tell you in a while why they couldn't. But they had begun to understand there is something extraordinary here. So he was given a job as a clerk in the port trust of Madras. Now his boss was a good man. The boss of the port trust was a good man. He let Ramanujan be. So much so that Ramanujan used to take paper from the files on which one side there would be official notings and the other side would be blank. And he would do mathematics on mm -hmm. that and the boss wouldn't mind. Because he was obsessed with mathematics. That was it. That was his world. But it gave him a little bit of financial support. It wasn't much, 
but he wasn't complaining you know he was happy with it but this business of ramanujan wanting to talk to someone on reasonably equal terms so that you can start understanding what you yourself have achieved you see no matter how much you do by yourself there must be at least one person who comes forward and says yes this is worthy it you need something like that and there wasn't anyone around but people in the port trust and some amateur mathematicians in madras encouraged ramanujan to write to people in india first and he received strange responses because mathematicians in india were unable to tell what he was doing samajh mein nahi aa raha tha logon ke ki ye kar kya rahe hain to koi theek se jawab nobody really answered the way you expect they would then he was asked to write to mathematicians in great britain you know the british ruled india in those days and we were valued everything that came to us from them in india that was the epitome sometimes i wonder kuch bhool hui ramanujan se agar unhone germany mein likha hota germany was the center of mathematics in the world then or paris the other center britain wasn't the center and so he wrote to many good mathematicians in britain but nobody answered they, they didn't even acknowledge his letters except one person who wrote back telling him that you know you could do a little bit about your english you know, language hmm. your grammar no comment on the mathematics but here's where one must recognize ramanujan's self confidence he was never dismayed two things are very clear he continued producing mathematics of an extraordinary order even though he wasn't receiving any recognition and two he was always quietly confident never over confident never vain but quiet confidence and you know when you have that quiet confidence i'm again reminded of kabir you know jab main tha tab hari nahi ab hari hai jab main nahi you know when you have this huge ego your god will not really come to you but when you get rid of that there's room for your god to then enter your god comes to you and so that happened with ramanujan that his god had come because he was not vain he was humble finally you see that's where i believe something special happens he wrote a letter to this mathematician at cambridge then easily the leading mathematician in great britain g h hardy mm -hmm. and this is an amazing story hardy was a great mathematician one of the greatest in his area in the world and hardy himself writes that account इट्स एन वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग अकाउंट मैं यहाँ पर जो बच्चे हैं अभी कॉलेज और स्कूल के मैं उनसे अनुरोध करूंगा कि आप इसको जरूर पढ़िए रामानुजन की कहानी उसका हमने हिंदी में एक अनुवाद तैयार किया है और बहुत कम दाम पर नेशनल बुक ट्रस्ट से वो पुस्तिका अभी रिलीज होने वाली है आप जरूर उसको पढ़िएगा पूरी कहानी है उसकी तो रामानुजन रोट टू हार्डी हार्डी सेज दैट इज मेल यूज टू बी प्रोड्यूस बिफोर हिम just after breakfast every morning and amongst the letters of the day he saw a letter from india and he says i open the letter and the letter starts you know i am a clerk at the port trust in madras i beg to introduce myself It's complete humility and i'll tell you how notable this humility is in a minute in my spare time i work on mathematics and i have produced some theorems and i am listing some of them for your attention i would be deeply obliged if you could comment on them and then hardy saw a list of statements mathematical formulae one after the other he glanced at it paid a little bit of attention then he tossed it aside and he went away for a game of tennis and then attended to his duties for the whole day but hardy writes that the whole day that letter kept bothering him when he returned to his study in the evening 
it had actually begun to take possession of him. And he sent for his colleague and closest mathematical collaborator, Littlewood, who incidentally happens to be my mathematical grandfather. So Littlewood and Hardy sat down again and looked at the formulae. And then it dawned upon Hardy. They said, these are extraordinary formulae. Adbhut hain. Kabhi aisa dekha nahi tha. Zyada tar kahin dunia mein. And then Hardy says, it can only happen under two circumstances. That's what he and Littlewood thought. Either the man is a complete fraud who's trying to fool us, or he is a genius of the highest order. And Hardy said, if you are a fraud trying to fool people, you really can't produce this kind of stuff. It requires some understanding of mathematics to write that kind of formula. So the man must therefore be a genius. And that's when they concluded the man is a genius and we must bring him over to England. Hindustan say England leana chahiye. So they started making arrangements for Ramanujan to travel to England. Now here's something I want to say, Manil, at this time. This would of course be of more interest to you, but all of the audience too. It took a little bit of effort for Ramanujan to travel to England. Pahle to unki maa nahi tayyar ho rahi thi. Phir kisi tarah maa tayyar hui. Phir maa ne kaha ki patni nahi jayengi ya akele jaye. Tarah tarah ki baad hai. There were lots of, you know, obstacles in his way. But eventually everything worked out and he set sail for England. When he set sail for England, at that point in time, Ramanujan sitting by himself in this isolated place in India without access to mathematicians, without access to journals, without much access to great books, had single-handedly recreated some of the greatest triumphs of European mathematics of 200 years. One man, just imagine this, here's the might of Europe, 200 years of this great tradition great mathematicians, extraordinary ideas. Here is this one man, unaided by himself, without access to high-end knowledge, he reproduces this mathematics of this order that Europe has recognized for 200 years, the great triumphs. That was his achievement. So when he went to Hardy, Hardy began to start talking to him immediately. Ramanujan wasn't used to the ways of the British. Let me, let me just interrupt you a little because uh, just in terms of what you said, uh, the little I know about Ramanujan was that just the way he did mathematics was somewhat different from the usual Western way of actually doing a theorem, a proof, and so on. He seemed to almost have s almost some sort of inspiration, uh, intuition, more than actual working out proofs and so on. How did, how did the British uh, react to that? How did uh, oh. Hardy react to that? Because even his notation was different. Well, uh, Hardy, Hardy, so Hardy has many interesting things to say about that. And one must recognize Hardy's contribution in this because he tried to somehow, in, in, in some senses, tame Ramanujan. Thoda sa unko dharti pe utarne ki koshish kar rahe the. Wo to upar the devtaon ke saath. He was trying to get him down a little bit so that others could follow what he was doing. Not, not because he wanted anything to be corrected really in Ramanujan so that others could follow what he was doing. So yes, Ramanujan had his own way of working. He could see things in a flash. And that's something that very few people have the gift for. And so others couldn't understand and sometimes even Ramanujan couldn't explain. You know, once Hardy, Littlewood and Ramanujan were working on a mathematical problem and they were looking for a specific number for an upper bound for an inequality. As soon as Ramanujan saw the inequality, he said pi by 4 is the best number. So Hardy and Littlewood asked him, how do you know that? He says, I don't know, but that's the best number. Then Hardy says, and this is Hardy, the greatest man in his field. Hardy and Littlewood worked for two days, non-stop. And then they could prove that pi by 4 is the best number. So you, you see the difference. I see the difference, but again, uh, having been trained as a mathematician, um, you know, in terms of the proof theorem type of approach, 
Uh, I'm, I'm naturally, the, the thing that I recall is uh, you know, the most famous problem in math, perhaps, which many of you might have also heard of, the Fermat's last theorem. Uh, and this was something which almost has the same feel to it. Uh, and Fermat was uh, a French mathematician, yeah. I guess. And, uh, you know, he was, he was involved in number theory, which, again, is this one of the big fields for Ramanujan. Uh, if you look at the Pythagoras theorem, it says x squared plus y squared equals z squared. You know, if you look at the sides of a triangle, uh, the sides of a right angle triangle have this formula, which we all learn in geometry. So what uh, Fermat said was that, you know, you can certainly come up with numbers like if you take 3 squared plus 4 squared, you get 5 squared. 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, and add them together, you get 25, which is 5 squared. So that's, that's 25. So you can get 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. Well, what Fermat said is that if you make it x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed, there are no numbers x, y, and z such that that equality is satisfied by whole numbers. In fact, you can't do it for x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z to the fourth. Or for any integer, you can't do it for x to the 20 plus y to the 20 equals z to the 20. So, so the really romantic kind of thing that obsessed mathematicians for, many for more than a century was that he wrote uh, on the margin of his book that he wrote this theorem down that this can never be done and he said that I've found the most marvelous proof for this but this margin is too small for me to actually write down the proof and then he died. And then no one knew whether he actually had a proof or not. I mean the theorem seemed correct but no one knew whether he had a proof or not. Uh, and that's been a big pursuit in mathematics. It was proven many, you know, a long time uh, later. But the reason I'm digressing to that is because here was Ramanujan writing down similar things, writing down similar theorems, which he intuitively uh, figured out, much like Fermat must have intuitively figured out this famous theorem. And yet he wasn't always, he wasn't really a, a theorem prover. Uh, actually, Manin, it's not as uh, straightforward as that. He was. Okay. So he would, he would justify his ideas. Mm -hmm. The thing is that you had to be a professional mathematician to then polish the, the supporting arguments that Ramanujan would give. Because of two or three reasons. One, of course, some ideas would be so obvious to him, he wouldn't write them down. Mm -hmm. So you needed a lesser person to at least fill those gaps for lesser mortals. The other thing is that, yes, Ramanujan did not understand in complete fashion the requirements of a modern rigorous proof in mathematics. But you know, if you look at all the mathematics that he did after he went to Cambridge, and you can see where Ramanujan has contributed, and that contribution cannot come from anyone else. And then Hardy and others contributed by filling in those details and gaps that if Hardy had not been around, other mathematicians could also have done quite easily. But there with Hardy, then his ideas began to be put down in proper form and the world then began to sit up and take notice of Ramanujan. They proved extraordinary theorems. They, these are remarkable things. Of course, to understand Ramanujan's discoveries, you don't need to know any math beyond the school level to at least understand the statements. The proofs are a different matter altogether. That requires a sophistication in mathematics that is of a very high order. But the statements are pretty easy to understand, very, very easy to follow. You know? and, and let me just go back to this point of proof, just because mathematicians are so uh, obsessed almost with proof. Um, was he ever wrong? Did he make some things yes, that... Yes, he was wrong in some senses. Okay. So there was this one theorem that he discovered before he traveled to England. It's a deep theorem. It is one of the greatest ideas in, math, in the history of mathematics. I talk of the prime number theorem. Mm -hmm. So first he understood what the statement is. And then he started giving a proof. His proof had gaps in it. So that proof wouldn't work. But anybody who is trained in a graduate course in complex analysis would be able to give that proof, looking at Ramanujan's proof. So he wasn't wrong, wrong. 
the statement was correct and Littlewood writes that just looking at the statement, that discovery alone is enough to rank Ramanujan in the first order of mathematicians. That alone is enough to do that by yourself. But then of course he was Ramanujan, he set forth a proof as well. There are gaps and mistakes sure. in his ideas because he didn't know branches of mathematics. So let's actually pick up on that, just the fact that mathematics is so broad, it has so many different branches. Uh, most of Ramanujan's contributions came in number theory, which, uh, which uh, you know, I, as you said, is something that you know, we can all actually understand very easily, um, at least the statements, like the one I just said about Fermat's last theorem. Um, number theory essentially deals with uh, properties of prime numbers, of numbers and so on, different kinds of inequalities, uh, things that are relatively accessible. And I, I, I think that uh, because of that perhaps, uh, that is one of the main topics that you know, a lot of popular books on mathematics have been written on. Uh, in fact, we have Simon Singh as part of the uh, festival uh, here and he wrote this amazing book on Fermat's Last Theorem. Um, now, of course, mathematics is not just number theory, it's all these other fields, complex analysis, uh, a lot of applied mathematics, which is what I do. And um, it's always been a question as to which mathematics, uh, or, sh or is there an order relation between these mathematics? I mean, this is, you know, this, this, this is almost like an internal question amongst mathematicians, you know, people, uh, ask questions like, okay, what is number theory useful for? What is this useful for? How would you respond to that? If one, if one actually asked, okay, Ramanujan had discoveries, but, and this is something I'm asked all the time, you know, by students, why do I have to learn this? What is this useful for? So how would you answer that? Well, okay, so, you know, there are two ways of looking at mathematics and science in general. You know, it's, it's art for the sake of art, but it's also useful. Now. Time has told us that no matter what mathematics you do, it is always applied. I cannot think of any branch of mathematics that doesn't have useful applications, no matter how it was invented. It could be invented in the most abstract of settings. But because it comes from the real world, it gets applied somewhere or the other. So Ramanujan's mathematics has been applied in many areas it, with great success. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's never been just mathematics for the sake of mathematics. This was even Hardy's viewpoint. I only do mathematics because it's an art form. I don't treat it as something that will be useful in life and I'm happy about it. And Hardy was a pacifist, he didn't like war. But the mathematics that Hardy discovered is used now to guide missiles. In fact, uh, Hardy, I mean, his famous book is called A Mathematician's Apology. Has anyone uh, in the audience read that? Okay. And I think just, just to reiterate what you said, the, the two messages I got from that book was uh, he likes mathematics because A, it's very difficult, and B, it's completely useless. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's what he says, that I don't like applicable mathematics because it doesn't look nice. I only like mathematics which looks nice, and if it looks nice, it's probably useless, and that's what I like about it. So it's, I think when we were talking earlier, you said that he must be turning over in his grave that you know, all his mathematics is now being applied. It, it is, it's being applied for purposes of war also. So that's, so, that's I mean, he's a pacifist and it's being right. applied he to that. He must be turning in his grave. But unlike Hardy, Ramanujan didn't really worry or think about these things. He just did them because he loved them. That was Ramanujan's, you know, humility. He didn't think about anything. Does the world think this is going to be useful? No. I just do it because I love it. But you know, he was innocent. The title, innocent genius. He was innocent in every sense of the term. In England, one of his biggest problems in his first few months there was he was cold in the rooms at Cambridge. And then he mentions this one day to a friend of his, an Indian, of course a very distinguished man, P.C. Mahalanobis, who was India's statistician who created the planning commission and the five-year plans and so on. And then Mahalanobis told him, so what do you do? He says, I sleep in my overcoat every day. Then he said, don't you use the blankets? And he said, I didn't even know there are any blankets. So the blankets, in Typically, the way they make beds, the Mr. Angrez banate hain, wo kambal ke upar safed chadar rakke aur daba dete hain side pe. To aisa lagta hai ki sirf chadar hai. They didn't realize that there is actually a blanket under the sheet. 
He had no idea. He was that innocent, that simple. And there were other things that were also beginning to get to him. So, you know, his wife was not with him. He was missing her sorely. So he finally fell ill. And I, I honestly feel that, you know, if he had been given, if his wife had traveled with him, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have happened. This is my feeling. Of course, it's a very personal thing. And I can't afford to say anything as my wife is in the audience here. Okay. So <laughs> need to be careful about right, that. Right. But so. it, it is like that. And, you know, he fell ill. He was admitted to a sanatorium in London. But he was seriously ill. Hardy realized that. But there's something interesting again. So he couldn't give up mathematics. And as Hardy says, ev every number was his personal friend. Dosti thi, har number se maitri thi. To Hardy jate hai Ramanujan ko hospital mein dekhne. He goes to the hospital and he sees that Ramanujan is not in the best of spirits. So he says, you know, Ramanujan, I traveled in this taxi and I noted the taxi cab number. It was 1729. I hope it is not an inauspicious number. And it took Ramanujan half a second to immediately respond and say, no, no, it's a very interesting number. It is the smallest number that can be written as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. You know, it takes a little bit of time to even explain right, this statement right, to anyone. Right. Yeah. And I'll be happy to explain it to you later. But just imagine, you know, just like that, off the top of his head, he says this. So uh, I just got a, yeah. a thing about 10 minutes left and I do want to talk about some other issues that, you know, Ramanujan's life is so inspirational. Uh, I mean, I think part of it is just the fact that he was such a genius, which of course, you know, most of us can only aspire to be. Uh, but coming, coming down to like people in the audience perhaps, or, you know, we have some really young people there who are uh, you know, budding mathematicians perhaps. Um, what, what, kind of, what kind of lesson do you think we can get out of his life that would be useful for, okay, not a super genius, but you know, just regular people who are interested in learning about mathematics? I mean, math is a very, very tough subject for so many people. So uh, what is, does this tell us anything? You know, I would, this is addressed to the young people in the audience, really for the youngsters. And I think even the old people, you know, they might be interested in learning a little more too. Pass so. it on to your grandchildren, right, right. the older people. <laughs> there are three lessons you draw from Ramanujan's life. One, and I have this from senior mathematicians and scientists of India. When I was a youngster, I had access to them because my father was a very senior mathematician of India. And his gurus, so that generation of scientists of India, have publicly acknowledged that they did great work because they derived self-confidence from the example of Ramanujan, that he could match and be more than an equal to the white man. You must remember, this is in the early part of the 20th century, when India was under British yoke, and we were a demoralized people. There was Gandhi leading this agitation, and we were trying to regain our confidence and our identity. And here comes Ramanujan, who outmatches the white man, so to say. And that gave confidence in a whole generation of scientists in India, began to acquire self-confidence. And you must read what Subramaniam Chandrasekhar writes, the Nobel laureate in physics. He says, when I was a student, there were four names. We were under British rule, and we were looking for identities that would, you know, inspire us. And there were four names that would do that. He says, Mahatma Gandhi, Ravindranath Thakur, Jawaharlal Nehru, and Srinivas Ramanujan. That's the importance of Ramanujan. That's the first thing we draw from his life. First inference. Two, you know, he became famous all his life. He wanted a little bit of money. And you know, he became famous. But the one thing, complete dedication and enjoyment from what he wanted to do, mathematics. He didn't care whether money came or not. He didn't give up maths. This love for the subject. So that's called finding that inner drum beat. He found it. And then he attached himself to it no matter what the price. He wasn't willing to give it up. Job or no job, he wasn't giving it up. That's the second lesson. 
The youngsters must understand this. Find that drum beat and attach yourself to it. It will take you forward. And the third lesson, which is extraordinary, his whole life he lived in poverty till he became famous towards the end of his life. What many don't know is that he was, I have read his wife's account written in Tamil on Ramanujan. And she writes that he was an extraordinary astrologer also. I'm not trying to say anything about astrology here. Don't misunderstand me. But Ramanujan told his wife and his mother, he predicted his date of demise well in advance, more than a year in advance. He knew he was going to die. He comes back to India and the British government sanctions a huge salary for Ramanujan. See, whole, his whole life he has lived in poverty. His father, mother, brother and wife have no income. They are dependent on him. And now the British, because he's world famous, sanction a huge salary. And what does Ramanujan do? He writes to the British government saying that I don't need this. This may be given to poor and talented students of India. This is how this great son of Mother India discharged his debt to Indian society. I want the youngsters to understand that. No matter how great you become, no matter what you do, this is the most important lesson from Ramanujan's life. Learn to discharge your debt to society. He did it. In doing so, he has made us indebted. And the onus is on you now to take this forward and to do good things for this nation and take things forward. But do not lose yourself. Do not be vain and do what you love. I think that's the most important lesson from his life. Okay. I think uh, at that point, maybe we should uh, see what questions we can sure. get from the audience. And you can ask uh, not just questions about Ramanujan, but, you know, some of the uh, issues that come out of his life and relate to mathematics in general. And I see there's a hand up uh, right there in the back. Okay. Uh, could we have, we have a mi microphone? Absolutely yeah. coming right your there. way. And we have one on the other side as well. We have a lot of questions I can see. So I'm, Excellent. You know. Excuse me. That doesn't mean we have the answers. No, we don't have the answers, so. <laughs> Made it. <laughs> My name is Vanessa. I'm a student of uh, mathematics and economics. Uh, I will base my question on the premise that mathematicians like Ramanujan can't be read. I'll just assume that for now. Uh, my question is that, I mean, this is a student's reflection and you know his tale inside out. When systems disappoint you or at the, when you're at the receiving end of uh, magisterial, high-handed, uh, educational uh, services being discharged, can we expect that potential Ramanujans will not be stultified or wiped out? I'm not even assuming that they can be read through certain formal mechanisms in our educational structure, particularly mathematics in India. Okay, well, uh, maybe since you're the vice chancellor of Delhi University, how do, how do you actually uh, well, look, account for that? Well, look, mathematics is, there's something very peculiar about mathematics. In social gatherings, whenever I introduce myself as a mathematician, people immediately respond that one, they're afraid of the discipline, and two, they never really understood it in school. I think somewhere this damage gets done to people at that level. And my feeling is that probably there isn't enough good teaching happening at the school level. There are lots of good teachers. That's one part. And two, of course, I mean, you must understand if Ramanujan were to come and fail in the English exam in my university today, I would still have to struggle to give him a degree. I would still have to. It's a huge struggle for me to change old systems. Okay, there's a question here, this gentleman here. One in the center, and then we have one on the side here. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's about teaching mathematics. Uh, it's often said that the worst teachers of mathematics are people who are good at maths because it's so easy for them. They can make intuitive leaps which normal people can't. Have you any comments on who makes the best maths teachers? You know, I'm not too sure. First of all, uh, a good teacher, you know, of course, doesn't always have to be a good mathematician, so there can be lots of good teachers who can show you the way. But I have known lots of extraordinary mathematicians. When I say extraordinary, leave Ramanujan aside, 
but in the realm of others, they stand at the very top and they're really good mathematicians Man and good teachers. Manil will agree with me, you know. My own professor was an extraordinary mathematician. He's still alive, by the way. But he was a great teacher too. I mean, he knew how to take you forward. So I don't really believe that. Yeah, and I would add to that. I mean, I, the reason I went into mathematics was because of a teacher who, uh, his name was Huzur Bazar, and he taught at the Institute of Science. He yeah, was a yeah. great mathematician. Yeah. And he's the one who said, okay, you need to switch from physics to maths. So that's what I did. Um, I also think that good mathematicians, they bring something extra to their teaching, especially in today's world, because they can relate it to applied problems. They can say, okay, this is, this is why you learned this, because here is where it's used. Here is where mathematics comes out in the real world. So that's another dimension. Okay, we have another question just here. Oh. Hi, um, my name is uh, Karthik. I think I'm a little too close to the speakers. Um, yeah, so thank you for your talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, I had a question about, uh, which kind of relates to the first question. And uh, I often find that uh, Ramanujam's like inspiring life is sort of used to prop up the wrong arguments. So here's a person who kind of got, uh, like he was bereft of systems and he somehow managed to make it through. And often it's sort of, if, when we talk about Indian science, productivity is like compared to a lot of the nations that we aspire to be with, like to be competing with, we are nowhere near where we should be. So whenever these kind of arguments come up, we kind of, instead of looking towards the future, we look towards the past. And we talk about inventing the zero and Ramanujam and, and sort of this fallacy that like true talent will just rise. So uh, I just wanted some comment on what kind of arguments or what kind of inspiration people have taken um, in terms of systems building from Ramanujam's experience. You must understand that, that you're not really, you're a little off the mark there. Uh, do, uh, do, do recognize this. I mean, there's much happening in Indian science in India today. It's not that we are nowhere near anybody else. Manil will agree with me, not just in mathematics, but in other realms of science in India. India is making enormous progress. Don't forget that there are only three countries in the world that have the might and the intellectual capacity to put a man on the moon. India is one of them. There's something happening here. It's not that we are in a vacuum. So there is some, there's a schoolboy there who raised his hand. Could we have a question from him? Some child raised yeah, his right hand. There. Oh, there yes, he okay. Yeah. And then we have one, a couple of gentlemen over here, all very keen. Here we go. Everyone knows that Ramanujan is a well-known mathematician. So didn't he get any job offers from uh, universities as a math teacher? Right, of course, of course, when he returned to India, uh, they made him a fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge, which, which is a great job, I mean. But he came back to India because he was not well and also he wanted to be with his wife and family. So they gave him a salary, it was a job. But he died one year after that. But till the moment he died, he kept doing mathematics. He had a salary, he gave it away. But he had it, he had a job. ask you one question that yes i think it's on it's sir. on it's on it's, it's on. on he he become very famous but his background was very poor how he has developed this sense of mathematics by intuition only or the system prevailing or the system prevailing in india where like ramanujam any other person could take opportunity and with the prevailing knowledge in the surrounding another Ramanujan can erupt. But there have been extraordinary mathematicians after him in India, and some of them have died very young like Ramanujan. Ramanujan died at age 32. They were, I, I can think of at least two really great mathematicians at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in mm -hmm. Mumbai who died in their 30s, mm. who were extraordinary, comparable to the best in the world. They died very early, and they were in the 70s and 80s. So it's not that that was the only case, and, and this happens all the time. We have a gentleman uh, in the front let's there, go to the and then next we have two one. more. Yes, please. Yep. Yes, hello, my name is Paul. I am a tourist from Ireland. My question is a simple one. In your opinion, is mathematics discovered or invented? It's, it's almost impossible to answer that. Manil, do you have any comments on this? I mean, I Well, I, 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 I like to say it's disvented. <laughs> <laughs> As long as it is not dysfunctional, I'm okay right, with right, it. Right. <laughs> uh, Professor Singh, you, Bruce Kodish from Los Angeles. 
Uh, you had talked about drum beat, the finding the drum beat and finding the rhythm as a kind of a meta, it seemed like you were using that as a kind of metaphor. But isn't there something more, isn't that something more than a metaphor if mathematics is a kind of the supreme language of exact relations and patterns? Because that's what rhythm and drum, drum beating is about. I know a teacher in the United States, and there might be other people who are teaching mathematics to children using dance and music. So do you have any comments about that? Two very quick comments. First and foremost, and I, Manil, I heard Manil's own uh, talk about his book, the novels that he has written, where he says he, he went from believing to a disbeliever to an agnostic, so I, I don't know how he will take this. <laughs> but as a mathematician, and many colleagues agree with me, we believe God is a mathematician. And therefore, everything in the world is imbued with mathematical patterns, ideas, and themes. And you know, I work in harmonic analysis. That really comes from music and stuff like that. So it has to be like, I believe that. Yes. So my we have a gentleman here. Moel. I'm an economics student. I want to ask, as we saw in Indian history, mathematics was studied, relating it with the philo uh, philosophy, like uh, uh, zero to atma and infinity to paramatma. So this is nowadays disattached mathematics philosophy. Do you think this is a, a big reason that we are not able to produce more of Ramana? No, no, uh, look, people like Ramanujan come once in centuries. It's not us. Nowhere in the world will you find his examples. They happen once in a blue, blue, blue moon, you know, so don't look for that too much. But there are lots of good people being produced in India and other places who are extraordinary. In this last century, there was a great Indian mathematician by the name of Harish Chandra who died largely unknown in India, though he had studied in India, worked with Homi Bhabha, and then gone on to Cambridge and then to Princeton, where he was professor at the Institute for Advanced Study. One of the greatest mathematicians of his time in the world. The extraordinary man of great power and vision. So that happens all the time. Don't worry too much about that. We have a student here, and then we'll come to you, sir. Uh, I had to ask a question like, when children study maths, I've seen most of the times like in other subject, in other subject it doesn't happen but like when you're studying maths most of the children like they'll have problems like headaches, then they have pro <laughs> many problems in their lives. But it's not usual in other subjects, why it's only in maths like it, whenever you read a newspaper there's an article written like children getting problems with maths, studying the, solving the problems. So I have a headache now, I don't think I'll answer that question. <laughs> But don't, don't get too worried, okay? Look, I can tell you a personal story, but don't take that as an inspiration. In my seventh standard annual math exam, I scored one out of 100. I, I did my best not to study math, but at the eighth grade, I found a teacher who just opened up the whole world for me, you know, through mathematics. So, so don't worry, the headaches will go away. You know? <laughs> Gentlemen here. You know, very few girls are drawn to mathematics. Perhaps uh, over the years, mathematics, mathematics has become masculine and uh, very abstract, very dry kind of uh, subject. What should be done to draw more girls to mathematics by feminizing it? <laughs> well, you know, so long as they're drawn to mathematicians, I'm okay with it. <laughs> But no, uh, I, I agree with you. I have mulled hard on this question. Is it true that girls don't like mathematics? No. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I really don't believe that. I think they're just as good. But you know, they, they have so many talents, whereas us men, we are so limited. Jo mil jata, we're happy with that. Girls move on to a hundred things. You know. So I should just point out that when I was going to college uh, in uh, Institute of Science in Bombay, we had, there were eight girls and only two boys in the class. So, you know, that, oh. that and, 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 and one other thing I'll just throw in that, if you go to my uh, website, uh, manilsuri.com, I have a video that I've put up called Math Heroine. And it's about this uh, exact question. And I've interviewed uh, female mathematicians and just see, just to see how, you know, how they have, they have actually had to work against this stereotype that girls don't like mathematics, it's just not true. And they're constantly having to fight that. So it's, uh, it's a two-way street. 
Yeah, just, just to add to Manal's, you know, at the University of Delhi where we have about 400 students in the master's program in mathematics. So this is a postgraduate program. There are 350 girls. So you think about that. That's too. amazing. Um, just out of interest, how many females are here? Raise your hand if you love maths. Okay, let's, let's clap for everyone. Yeah, great. We have time for two more questions. One gentleman here and one in the front, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Thank you. Now, one thing that comes out very clearly from your talk is that Ramanujan's mathematical ability was basically intuitive in nature. Now, this has been explained as resulting from a very excessive, narrow focus on mathematics to the exclusion of other routine concerns of life. Now, my question is, could this result from some kind of neuropsychological quirk, and could this be the opposite of what is called an ADHD. It is a psychiatric condition in which people cannot concentrate on one thing for too long, and they flit from one topic to another, one subject to another. Could this be explained? There have been some attempts made to explain people like John Nash, Einstein, and Ramanujam. Can you shed some light on that? You know, uh, it, it tends to project a stereotype which is not really there. I, I know mathematicians who are so devoted to maths, and Manil hopefully will agree with me, who are mm. extraordinary with mathematics, but they're just as good at handling stocks and shares or doing other things in life. It's not, that stereotype isn't there. You will always find quirky people amongst, you know, do you know Colin Cowdery, this great English cricketer? He was really good. I, but how many of us know that Cowdery had this strange quirk? Before every test innings, before he went out to bat, he would run around completely naked in the dressing room, make five rounds. What do you, what do you say to that? Well, he was a perfect and a great guy at that, but he was very good at other things also. So who knows? And we have time for one more question. Sir? My name is Ravi Jain. You, 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 you need to almost eat the mic, keep it close to you. I have been in engineering and my daughter is in the 11th grade. But we never studied Ramanujam. Read it from now. Now, what do you want to do with the National Book Trust? No, my book is going to be different. So, if you take it from the course textbooks, we have to read the Raja, the Rani, 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 दूसरे लोगों को पढ़ते हैं, धार्मिक गुरुओं को पढ़ते हैं, तो यदि इंडिया ने एक ऐसा मैथमेटिशियन दिया, तो उसके बारे में हिस्ट्री में क्यों नहीं पढ़ते, उसकी मैथ्स की चीजें क्यों नहीं पढ़ते? है, ऐसा नहीं है, मैं नहीं जानता यहाँ का पाठ्यक्रम क्या है, मुझे नहीं मालूम, वैसे रामानुजन extraordinary mathematics. The theorem of Pythagoras that you mentioned was discovered in India 300 years before Pythagoras but, by but Bodhayan I, and others. But I think what he's saying is that it's not part of the curriculum, that, that often that's not emphasized. Uh, uh, certainly when I, was, uh, when I was growing up, you know, we, not just in mathematics, we never had anything about Indian mathematics. And then also in literature, we were always studying, you know, not the Indian authors. So, that's, that's so why is that? That has changed. That has changed. That's changed. So if you look at the NCERT books, they do talk about the tradition of Indian mathematics from early times till Ramanujan. They mention that. And it is changing more and more. And you must tell your school that what prevents them, even if it is not prescribed in the syllabus, why don't they just introduce some simple things about such people to inspire and why, why just Ramanujan, Chandrasekhar, Venkat Raman, Subramaniam, Chandrasekhar, Hargovind, Khurana. You should talk about all of them. It's important. I agree with you. So I think that wraps it up. Manil, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, just that, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's great having this wonderful amount of feedback from people. I think, I think we could have probably gone on for another hour or so because I can still see lots of people had questions. And uh, perhaps you'd be willing to uh, talk to anyone who, who wants to come up and, and talk to us afterwards. Sure, but thank I, you so much for sharing all your thanks, uh, thoughts Manil, on this. Thanks, Manil. It was a delight sharing Absolutely. this thing, stage with you. And I 
I mean, an admirer of what you write outside of the world of mathematics. So mathematicians do other things. Right. He's, he's right. written two. The third novel is out as well. Yes, right? that's yeah. right. From the death of Vishnu to the age of Shiva, and the third one is called the city uh, of Devi. Yeah, mathematicians so, do other things. Remember that. Right. Right. Okay. So a yeah, round of applause for our wonderful panelists. Thank you Thank so you. much for coming.